Let's, let's start with learning some Hebrew. You want to learn some Hebrew? Yeah? Okay. Well, since we're talking about the Psalms tonight, and the Psalms were written in Hebrew, I thought I'd do a, a Psalm in Hebrew, not the whole Psalm, but a part of a Psalm in Hebrew, which is a prayer that I do with my students. So you get the, the Neshota House experience of praying <laughs> in Hebrew, um, and you, you just have to learn one phrase. Are you ready? Okay. So think about, uh, write one, the dialogue or the, the blessing at the beginning of the prayer. Uh, the, the person who's going to pray will, will say, the Lord be with you. And, and what do you say? Okay, I'm thinking about write one. This is a, this is a, from here on out, this is a right one lecture, and I just want to, okay, so, with your spirit, and then, and then I would say, let us pray. Okay, so we're going to do that in Hebrew. That's your part. You get to do this one line. So, um, I say, Adonai imachem, which means uh, Adonai, the Lord, imachem, with you, okay? And then this is the, your part that you get to learn. Repeat after me. V. v. Okay, like V E. V. v. Im. Im. Ru. Ru. Now this is this is why you study Hebrew to get to make noises like this one. Okay, ready? You, it's got to go back in your throat, way back there. Okay. And you get to do this is this is wonderful. You get to do it twice in a row. Okay. Ha ha. Okay. Okay, so let's do it one sound at a time. V, im, ru, cha, cha. One more time. V, im, ru, cha, cha. Okay, that means v and im with uh, ruach, your spirit, and uh, that cha on the end is yours, your spirit, okay? So you think you're ready to do that? What's that? Okay, thy spirit. Okay, but I, but I, but I say ha. You say thy, I say ha. Okay. Okay, and then the prayer is the very end of Psalm 19, and then I will. You will not have to do that part in Hebrew. I get. I'll do that part for us. Okay. So I say to you, Adonai imachem. Nit palala. That means let's pray. Yihyu l'ratzon imre fi v'hegyon libi l'fanecha Adonai tsuri v'goali. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The title of this talk this evening is The Psalms and Christian Worldview, and this is the second installment of our Christian Worldview series here at Neshota House. Last time, Father Andrew Grasso gave us an introduction to worldview, and I want to look at the ways that we think about Scripture in a Christian worldview, and I want to take the book of Psalms as a specific example. Here is what we're going to do tonight, the outline. Five sections. The first one is to think again or remind ourselves about worldview. What is worldview? And then I will, I'll explain what I mean by scripture glasses, looking through scripture as part of a Christian worldview, central to a Christian worldview. And then we'll look at these lenses that we have in our scripture glasses. We have the Old Testament lens and the New Testament lens. Two lenses. That's important. And then we'll think about what does it mean to see through both lenses, looking through both the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And finally, we'll end on the Book of Common Prayer to reflect somewhat if Maybe we have some new understandings as we come back to the Book of Common Prayer uh, at the end. 
first of all, worldview and scripture glasses. I'm not going to be able to be as nuanced as uh, Father Grasso was last time, and he gave us a, a very good introduction to worldview in, in philosophy and in, in Christian theology and the development of the idea of a worldview. And I've kind of just tried to give us a uh, learning from him some things, tried to give us a summary of worldview, especially if you weren't here last time, you'll need that. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm calling worldview, uh, give, give this description. A worldview is how we see and what we see when we look at the world around us. It's how we see and what we see when we look at the world around us. And it involves a complex set of stories, symbols, habitual practices, and answers to some fundamental questions. Like, where are we? Who are we? What's wrong with the world? What's the solution to the problem? Our worldview determines how we think, how we feel, how we act in our world. And it begins with the, the simple claim that we all wear glasses. Uh, I, I, looking out here, I don't, not everyone has glasses on, but uh, in, the, in the realm of worldview, we all wear glasses. Uh, we can never really get out of our glasses, though it's possible to change glasses, okay? to, have a, to have a conversion, to, to change your glasses. Um, but um, as we're born, we are immediately um, gaining our glasses, putting on our glasses okay? through learning language and, and learning things explicitly and implicitly from parents and from culture. All those things give us a way of seeing the world. And this is unconscious for us. It's just natural for us humans to gain these glasses, this way of seeing. And though we can become made aware of it, to, to realize, oh, I am wearing glasses. I didn't realize it. Uh, and that's what we want to do tonight, is to think about that, the fact that we do wear glasses. Um, and it's possible and, and, and a reality, in fact, that we wear different glasses. If you've ever talked to someone who has a different religion or if it comes from a different country, you immediately realize how different their glasses are from your glasses. The way they see the world is different from the way you see the world. And um, so there is a conflict of worldviews. And um, the great Anglican biblical scholar N.T. Wright has made a proposal about what he thinks would be a description of a dominant worldview in the modern West. Um, surprisingly, he says, it's not um, a question of the difference between an ancient worldview and a modern worldview. So today we have modern worldviews, and back then they had ancient worldviews. But in fact, ancient worldviews are still very much alive in our world. And he looks around and he sees uh, Epicureanism. Um, an ancient philosophy, he thinks that this is one way to describe the worldview of the modern West. The philosophy of Epicurus proposed that the world was not created by God or gods, and that if such beings did exist, they were remote from the world of humans. Our world and our lives are simply part of an ongoing self-developing cosmos in which change, development, decay, and death, death itself, operated entirely under their own steam. This is the philosophy, Wright claims, that our modern Western world has largely adopted as the norm. Now, you know, different scholars might quibble in some ways, but this idea that um, God doesn't exist or God, if God exists, that's the realm of religion. That's far away. It's not relevant to our lives today. Uh, that really does ring true today, um, that it's up to us. And uh, the, the, the broad 
common uh, application of this is what many of us think about when we think about Epicureanism. Uh, the desire and the pursuit for pleasure. That just have a good life. That's all you can hope for. Enjoy yourself. Actualize yourself. Uh, that very much is a, a determining pursuit that people have today with a worldview such as this. Uh, just one among many worldviews. Um, but a Christian worldview is going to come into conflict with a worldview such as this one. It's going to answer questions differently. Um, and I'd like to begin with an image used by the reformer John Calvin. And he's trying to explain the role of Scripture in Christianity. And, and he's saying the church gives us the Scriptures like a set of glasses that help us see. And you notice with this idea of worldview, the, the primary image is that of sight, of seeing. Okay? So this image or analogy that, that Calvin uses is very applicable to the question of worldview. He, he says this in his commentary on Genesis and also developed it in his institutes. With Scripture as our guide and teacher, not only does God make plain those things that would otherwise escape our notice, He virtually forces us to behold them as if He had assisted our dull sight with eyeglasses. Father Grasso talked last time about worldview involving a method and a content. So, Scripture is at the center of the Christian method for understanding the world, seeing through the revealed Scriptures, but it also is determining our content, and Calvin has seen this. It, it's like God is forcing us to look at something that we wouldn't otherwise look at. Now, you don't have to be a Calvinist to, to appreciate this image or to apply this image. Um, and um, there is a precedent within Scripture, even. Um, light for the eyes. God's word or God's commandments or God's instruction are talked about as a light. Now, why don't they use this image of, of glasses? Well, glasses hadn't been invented yet. So, uh, obviously they couldn't use it. So, but there is this idea of a light in the darkness allows you to see. So, it's a related kind of an image, and we have some references to this in the Psalms themselves. Psalm 19, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Or Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Why is that so important? Well, because you can't see in the dark. You'll fall down and you'll hurt yourself or, or get killed. You need to be able to see and the, God's word and commandments and instruction are thought of as a light, which is compatible with this image. And also, from within our own uh, Anglican tradition, we have references to Holy Scripture as containing all things necessary for salvation. In other words, Scripture is not an optional uh, piece of equipment for the Christian life. It is, it's necessary. You, you need it to be able to perceive and to actually uh, enter fully into salvation. Okay? And that it, it provides something that really isn't provided anywhere else. And also, uh, Article 7 talks about the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament is not contrary to the New. For both in the Old and New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ. That's an interesting formulation. Um, but basically, it presents to us two lenses, right? There is the Old Testament and the New. Scripture consists of the Old and the New. And both of these look to Jesus Christ and the everlasting life, the salvation that we have in Him. Both are essential. So let's think about this a little bit more, looking through these two lenses of the glasses of Scripture. So that's my way of representing one lens. Okay? It's, I think it's a monocle, but 
Uh, it's one lens. <laughs> Don't ever trust somebody with a monocle, okay. Uh, one, this one lens, uh, instead of looking back in history, the Old Testament looks forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what, that's what Article 7 is telling us. The New Testament also looks to Christ, but it looks in a different way. It looks back to Jesus Christ. So we have here two lenses, two perspectives on Christ, and you need the two, pers two lenses to have proper depth perception. Okay? You, you will be lacking if you just had one. Now, I also like to point out that this, this isn't all. Okay? Because both the Old Testament and the New Testament look forward to the second advent of Christ. There are passages of the Old Testament that are still looking forward to the future as we have in the New Testament. Um, so this is really a breakdown about what it is like to look through these scripture lenses. Old and New Testaments together. The Old Testament looks forward to Jesus Christ's first and second advents. The New Testament looks back to his first advent and ahead to his second advent. Now, this would suggest problems. Looking through one lens, okay? We've already seen different worldviews, different sets of glasses. There are many glasses out there. But we can also have a faulty uh, pair of glasses. That is, the, with the Old Testament only, uh, there was an early sect called the Ebionites, Ebionism. And they, they held the Old Testament to be Scripture, and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was a man, but he wasn't God's Son. He wasn't divine. And uh, there's some debate whether they accepted any of the New Testament, maybe one, maybe one gospel in Aramaic or something like that, but they definitely didn't, have the whole, didn't accept the whole Old Testament canon or the, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity or the deity of Christ. Okay, not too many Ebionites probably running around these days. But Judaism rejects the claim that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and does not accept the New Testament. So that's, Judaism has a partial view, necessarily. And it, instead of relating the, the Old Testament scriptures to the New Testament, they relate it to the history of Jewish interpretation. So that's a partial view. Another one, which is very common today, is New Testament only Christians, um, which is a heresy called Marcionism, because Marcion was uh, a teacher in the early church who said, it looks like there are two gods here. There's this Old Testament God who's God of justice, God of wrath, and the loving God of the New Testament. And now that the loving God is here in Jesus Christ, we don't need that that you know, wrathful creator God, the just God, we don't need him anymore, we get rid of that. That's very common, and that's looking through one lens. It's a distorted, distorted view. Let's, let's look now, let's focus in on the Old Testament lens. And I want to give you, using the Psalms as an example, four themes of the Psalms. Four themes of the Psalms. God's creation, God's care, God's covenant, and God's kingdom. And, and now I'm going to read a lot of scripture to you. So it's okay if you didn't bring a Bible tonight, although that would be great, but because I'm going to read you a lot of scripture, okay? And this is going to, um, I, it's going to be a guided tour of themes of the Psalms and then some themes about the Psalms in the New Testament. God is the creator of the earth in the Psalms. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. I, this is speaking in, in terms of ancient Near Eastern 
cosmology, ancient ne Near Eastern creation ideas, um, and they believed that the Earth was uh, a, a single piece that was supported in the waters on pedestals. Okay, this idea about being on the waters. So that was just the, the, the best science of that day. That was just the, the most recent cutting edge thinking in the ancient Near East. But the radical claim is that there is one God who is the creator of the whole world. Okay? That, that's, the, that's the revelation here. That's the, the, the radical claim that the Israelites are making. Um, God is also the creator of the heavens. Praise the Lord, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Psalm 148, verses, six, verses 4 through 6. This is the other part of the creation, the heavens above, and here you also get this idea that there's a dome with waters supported above it. But the psalmist calls upon the heavens themselves to praise God for the creation. Okay? Acknowledging God as a creator leads to worship, leads to praise. God created the, the, the world, the heavens and the earth, but God also created humanity and gave them a special role within the creation. You have made man a little lower than the heavenly beings, the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. This is an exalted view of humanity within the ancient Near East. And this includes men and women. They're treated as the kings of creation, the pinnacle of God's creation, given this place of honor. The creator God is also the caring God. God doesn't just start the creation going like a watch and take a vacation. God continues to be active within the creation. We see this clearly in Psalm 104. Speaking of God, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. So not only did God start the creation at the beginning, but God is there day by day giving water to animals to drink. And it, the next part of the psalm talks about God makes grass sprout. So you see this, God is continually involved in the creation, active in it, and showing care for all things. And also for people. Psalm 103 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. All this care that God shows to individuals, to to, to people who are the object of his love and, and care. Forgiving, healing, saving from death. This God is not only the creator and the, the, the loving uh, provider, but also the covenant maker. Making covenants, which are actually legal contracts. Okay? It, Amazing that God chose to save humanity by making contracts. Because as somebody who doesn't care that much for paperwork, it's uh, always, always mar a marvel to me. But God makes contracts, covenants, with people. Entering into limitations, entering into obligations 
with people. Amazing. God makes covenant with, covenant with the patriarchs. God remembers His covenant forever. The word that He commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant that He made with Abraham. His sworn promise to Isaac, which He confirmed to Jacob as a statute. To Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. God made a covenant to give the land to the patriarchs. God made a covenant with the people at Sinai after bringing them out of Exodus. God made a covenant with David. Psalm 89 speaks to this covenant. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And it's this idea that God announced his covenant in heaven, and therefore it is unshakable, this covenant. You have said, I have made my covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. Okay? The covenant with David that there would be a king ruling eternally on his throne. In addition to being a covenant maker, this God is the king. By, by means of creation, God has the, the role and the right to rule over the world as a king, and not just a despot, but as a just, loving king. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. The world is seen as God's kingdom, and he is a just king, a king who loves righteousness. But there's also a sense in which that justice hasn't fully been realized. It hasn't fully come in a world where there is wickedness and there is sin. And so you have other passages that talk about this idea of waiting for God's justice to come. Psalm 96 is one of these. Uh, reading partway down, all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. So there's an idea that this kingdom has to come to the earth. That the justice and righteousness of God's kingdom is still yet to be fully realized. There's a longing for the, this kingdom of God to come in its fullness. So I'm sure showing you four important themes in the book of Psalms. God's creation, God's care, God's covenants, and God's kingdom. The Psalms have been called the little Bible. The little Bible, because there's an idea that all the themes of the Bible can be found there in the Psalms. And so these are major themes of all of Scripture that run through the Psalms. And if, as we're looking through the Psalms as that Old Testament lens, this is what we see the, of the world as we look through it. So now let's move from our Old Testament lens to our New Testament lens. And again, we're going to look at Psalms in the New Testament and see what we see in this case, the New Testament lens. And I want to give you two themes in the New Testament. Different themes here a different emphasis that we, we get in the New Testament. Number one, the Psalms speak of Christ. Shot through the New Testament, you see them using the Psalms over and over again to talk about Christ. And what do I mean when I say Christ? Well, Christ it comes from the Greek word Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach, which means uh, anointed one the king would be anointed. Uh, and then uh, uh, one way of rendering that is Messiah. You hear that? Mashiach, Messiah. Okay, that's a rendering of the Hebrew. So 
it's talking about this anointed king who is to come and who is now here in Jesus Christ. That's the first point. The Psalms speak of Christ. The second point is that Christ speaks in the Psalms. Christ speaks in the Psalms. Let me explain the difference between these two. The first one talks about the third person, he. The second point talks about the first person. When you hear this voice in the Psalms, I, very frequently in the New Testament, the Psalms are used to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. When the psalmist says, I, that's, that's Christ speaking. And let me show you what might be perhaps the most important passage for seeing this, um, or set of passages. It's a use of Psalm 110 to illustrate the fact that the psalms speak of Christ. Jesus himself has been, has been questioned by the Pharisees, and he takes the opportunity to give them a question. Okay, to pose one to them. Jesus asked the Pharisees a question, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, in the Spirit, that is moved by the Holy Spirit, he, just, he wasn't just writing pop songs, he was being moved by the Holy Spirit to to compose these, this poetry, these psalms. David calls him Lord, saying, and then he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, now, <laughs> sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. There are a whole lot of lords here. So, uh, Psalm 110 is a psalm of David. So Jesus is saying, okay, David is the speaker in this case. That's what the superscription says, Psalm of David. But David speaks of two lords. The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord of David. So the first Lord is God. God said to another Lord, this Lord over David, himself the greatest king in Israel's history, sit at my right hand. What, where is that? That is at the right hand of God's throne in heaven. So not only is he called Lord, but he has this exalted place above the whole creation. God's place of rulership above everything. Jesus says, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word. And after that, no one... <laughs> No one wanted to bring up anything with him anymore. They, they were intimidated by this uh, impressive interpretation of Psalm 110. But this psalm is probably the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament. So you hear, have it here in Matthew, it's in Mark 12, it's in Luke 20, it's in Acts 2, it's in 1 Corinthians 15, it's in Hebrews 1, and Hebrews also cites the same psalm, other verses in it, several times. Later on the same psalm, uh, this king, is said of this king um, uh, that his priesthood is forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, he's the Lord of David, he's sitting at God's right hand in heaven, and he is going to have a priesthood that lasts forever. So, uh, this is clearly uh, beyond a, a normal human king. The Psalms speak of Christ. That was we see here. Also, Christ speaks in the Psalms. And this use of the Psalms goes back to Jesus himself. That all of the Gospels weave Psalms through their crucifixion stories. It, they're, they're, they're writing about the crucifixion, but they're all thinking in terms of the Psalms. And they all agree that Jesus was quoting psalms on the cross. They mentioned different psalms, interestingly, but they all agree that he was quoting psalms in the first person on the cross. Matthew 27, and, and parallel in Mark 15, Jesus cried out with a loud voice from the cross, saying, Eli, Eli, 
Lema Sabachthani. So Matthew quotes this Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic as his first language. He quotes it in Aramaic, and then he helpfully gives us a translation for, for those of us who don't know the Aramaic. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus said on the cross in Matthew and Mark. And then the people standing around him say, oh, he's calling for Elijah. Because uh, Elijah sounds like Eli. Eliyahu or something like that. Eliyahu, Eli. So the people around him misunderstand what's happening. But he's quoting the, the first verse of this psalm. And probably because he's also quote, because he's quoting the very first verse, there was no, there, were, there, there weren't uh, chapter titles in their Bibles, so uh, that would be the way of referring to this psalm probably as a whole. And go home and read Psalm 22 all the way through to the end, and I think you'll find some resurrection at the end of the psalm. Let's look at Luke. Luke lets us hear other psalms that Jesus is praying on the cross. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, again, the loud voice at the very end, from the cross said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, which is Psalm 31, verse 5. These are Davidic psalms uh, of, of lament, of suffering. Uh, by the way, there are more lament psalms in the Psalter than any other type of psalms. Um, but these are the lament psalms that Jesus is, is speaking on the cross. So, in Psalm 22, it's this idea of being abandoned, of experiencing abandonment. Here it's the sense of trust in the midst of suffering, committing my spirit into God's hands. And finally, in John, uh, another psalm. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, and John, the evangelist puts in, to fulfill Scripture, because it's a, it's a small quote, and he wants you to get it. This is from Scripture. I thirst. This comes out of Psalm 69, verse 21. But it's not just this reference, I thirst. It's also the sour wine. Remember the sour wine? That's what happens in Psalm 69. The, the speaker who thirsts gets sour wine. That happens immediately after this in John's Gospel. So, so Jesus himself, uh, as attested in all the Gospels, is praying the Psalms on the cross. He's speaking them in the first person. He's saying, that I, uh, that is, I am the I of the Psalms. Uh, and there are many implications of this, but one implication of this is that it is actually impossible to understand what's going on in the cross without understanding these psalms. Right? Jesus is saying, he, he's speaking the psalms at that moment, that the psalms are what interpret what's happening there, what, what makes sense of what Jesus was doing, dying on the cross. That's how important they are. It, it's, you can't really fully understand it without those psalms. So here we have the, the two themes in the New Testament when we look at the Psalms there. First, that the Psalms speak of Christ, the anointed King who is to come, and that Christ speaks in the Psalms, that that praying voice is actually the Christ. So let me give you an example of what could be called seeing with both lenses. Okay? So we have the, the themes from the Psalms that I showed you on the one hand and the themes from the New Testament on the other. Let me give you one example from St. Paul where you see something going on that's uh, bringing these things together. At the end of his letter to the Romans, he's talking about, about conflicts in the church and he's addressing these conflicts. And, uh, you know, he could just give some, some management guidance, some, uh, you know, some, some self-help principles there at the end. But what he does is he goes to Scripture. He goes to the Psalms. And he interprets the Psalms in order to instruct them in this, this very practical conflict um, of, of people who are strong and weak. He calls them strong and weak. Um, 
we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. This is his pastoral instruction. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Okay? Now he goes to the example of Christ. For Christ did not please himself. But he doesn't stop there. He quotes a psalm, Psalm 69. But it, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Okay? That me is Jesus Christ. So again, he's interpreting it as the speaker in the psalm is Jesus, is the Christ. And so he, he first of all reads it of Christ, and then he says, this provides a model secondarily for us, for the church. Um, and so I like to say we have to recite the psalms in the third person before we pray them in the first person. And often the problems we have is because uh, we, we, admirably, we want to uh, just assume it, just adopt it. This is my prayer. I'm going to pray it. But, uh, but this way of interpreting the psalms understands it as first in the third person uh, before being, becoming my prayer. This is what we see going on with Paul. But then he, he gives us a principle of interpretation, principle of understanding Scripture. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, he says. So this is the, the, the principle behind this application of Psalm 69 he just gave. That through, the endur- through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So it was written in the past, but God intended it for our present, for the for the the issues that face us, for our troubles and challenges that we have today. But not only that, it's because we're also looking to the future, to the hope. And you see here a scheme like this. Uh, The Old Testament points to Christ. The New Testament points back to Christ. But both of them give us hope. They give us a vision of the end. Now for Paul... He doesn't have the New Testament lens there, but he has the apostolic teaching the teach, and the teachings of Christ received uh, through the, the apostles. So that's his, that's his New Testament lens before the New Testament was written. But he's, he's using the Old Testament and that, that teaching of Christ, apostolic teaching, and he is rendering an interpretation that addresses the direct needs of his congregation. He's looking, if you will, through both lenses. Let's return again to those four worldview questions that were in my little description of worldview at the beginning. Worldview asks these big questions, foundational questions. Where are we? Who are we? What's wrong with the world? What's the solution to our problems? And Scripture answers, answers these questions. Um, the, the, the Psalms answer these questions that we are living in a world that God, the one God, created. Uh, We are sinful, fallen people in need of God's care and salvation. Um, We're also beautiful creations of God made in His own image for an exalted place in this world. And through Jesus Christ, death, resurrection, ascension and coming again, uh, we have a solution to, to the problem. This is the, the subject matter of Scripture. And so now thinking about reading these, these, with these two lenses, looking through these two lenses, um, and remembering those themes that I gave you, we, we, we see that the, that the Son is the Creator, that this creator we got to know in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, uh, is the father of the Son, who is the creator. Uh, We see that God's expression of love to us is through the Son. Um, We see that the Son covenants, in the New Covenant, the Son is the one covenanting with us, and that the, the... the Son is the King over God's kingdom. And uh, I just thought of Revelation 7, where in this heavenly vision, 
sitting upon the throne is the Lamb who was slain. The Lamb who was slain is the king over God's kingdom. So the, these two, the, these two uh, lenses focus together, and we see a, a convergence here of, of God, the, the God we meet in the Old Testament and the God we meet in the New Testament as one and the same God. And it's this kind of reading and, and looking and seeing that actually that resulted in the, the, the expression of the doctrines of the Trinity. Um, it required holding together Old and New Testaments. What about the Book of Common Prayer? I want to end with just a few comments on the Book of Common Prayer. The Psalter is like the beating heart of the Book of Prayer, of our Book of Prayer. It's pumping blood throughout the whole, throughout, throughout the whole prayer book. Okay? That's why the, the Psalter is always in the prayer book. It's the only book of the Bible that gets to be in the prayer book. Um, because it's, it's, it's pumping the lifeblood uh, of, of the scriptures throughout the whole prayer book. I, I once went to a uh, talk on the Psalms. And uh, it was at a, a mega church. I won't name any names. But it was at a big church with a lot of people go there. A lot of people showed up. A lot of people showed up tonight. This is great. Uh, a lot of people showed up for this talk. And uh, it was on the Psalms and uh, um, the spirituality of the Psalms. There's a question and answer time at the end. And a woman raised her hand in this large auditorium and she said, I'm convinced the Psalms are essential for the Christian life. I need, to, I need the Psalms so much more. I need the Psalms every day. Is there any way to, uh, like... Pray the Psalms every day, maybe at the beginning of the day uh, and at the end of the day. Is there any way like every Sunday to use the Psalms? Or if there was some kind of special occasion, we would have Psalms for that special occasion. Or throughout the whole month, maybe just go through the whole Psalter throughout the whole month. Or, or even the year, if maybe, maybe across the whole year, if I could just get Psalms in all those times. And the, the speaker said, no, nah, there's, really, there's really no, there's no way to do that. You just have to do your best. You know, I'm, I'm glad you, you've, you're convinced of the Psalms report. So those who are laughing know that, yes, there is. The prayer book. The prayer book. The prayer book. It has psalms. Have you noticed that? Everything has psalms. You have to have a psalm. There's a psalm in everything. Okay? There are psalms for every day Every week, every month, every occasion, every season of the year, there are psalms. And one reason for this, maybe we'll get some clarity on one reason for this, because the psalms are to saturate us and to form our worldview. That those, those themes and others are getting inculcated into us as we as we recite and sing and pray the psalms uh, every day. Um, and it's that worldview that, that the New Testament lives in. Two other observations about the, the prayer book Psalter. It's very interesting when you're coming from the New Testament, you see the ways that they find Christ in the psalms that um, the, the prayer book Psalter traditionally removes the superscriptions, all the titles that have authors' names on them. It removes those, and the, the whole Psalter sits under the title, The Psalms of David. And it doesn't just mean the historical David, but it also can refer to David's greater son, like we saw in Psalm 110. So that's very much in keeping with this way of viewing that we see in the New Testament itself, this way of viewing the Psalter. And the, the other thing is the practice within the Anglican tradition of always ending with the Gloria Patri. You always have to say the Gloria Patri. And what the Gloria Patri expresses is that this God is the same God whom we worship in Jesus Christ. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the Psalms, is the same God as the New Testament. 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's end with the Gloria Patri. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We made it. So thank you very much for your attention. I think we have some minutes for some questions or some discussion. Um, so any, any thoughts, questions? Yeah. That's sort of like the minimum. You have to <laughs> have at least that. Any other, any other questions or comments? Yeah, well, um, that's a great question. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the four Gospels' accounts, there are differences, but there are also a large number of similarities. They all agree on the basics of what's happening here, of Jesus being crucified. And they, they all also agree on the idea of him speaking or praying psalms. They all, they all agree on that. Um, and there's probably also, um, there is authorial license that's involved with what they want, what they are choosing to, to give us. Uh, they're about which psalms they choose um, to quote. Um, they're, not, they're not giving us every, everything they could possibly give us about that. Um, so even though there were people who there were people who were misunderstanding. You know, there were lots of eyewitnesses, uh, and there was lots of potential to receive information about what was happening at the cross. So, um, you know, I think probably, you know, he was quoting, speaking uh, a, a number of psalms, probably more than we have evidence of. And these, off, these evangelists, of the authors of the gospel, are, are selecting from those for what we actually get quoted in but it's it's remarkable um, the things they they share and not everything that is different would I attribute to like like errors or a garbled message or something because they're they're cl clearly shaping it as authors the way that it's going to fit with their themes that they have in their gospels so it, it's a complicated it's a complicated issue um, and that's my short answer about that Any others? These are good questions. Yeah, great. Oh. Yes, that's a great question. Um, I, I believe that the, sal, the Psalter, you know, that's our way of referring to it as a whole unit, the Psalter is a composition, that it's not just a random pile of psalms, um, and it's even, there's more structure even than our hymnal has. Um, it has an introduction in Psalms 1 and 2. It has an internal division into five books, each, each of the five books has a doxology at the end of it. Uh, it has a conclusion of five psalms. So, conclusion of five psalms, that is a connection to the five, five sections of the, the whole. Um, and it seems to emphasize the themes of God's instruction, like Psalm 1, and God's kingdom, Psalm 2. 
and you'll see those themes. So we don't know who, uh, in fact, we don't really know any of the authors of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the prophet, the prophetic books, they in include the prophet's words. So they have Isaiah's words and Jeremiah's words, but, but in terms of an author who is putting together the book and collecting them, we don't know those names because um, partly ancient authorship, you know, uh, we have this idea of copyright and, uh, you know, avoiding plagiarism and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, you have to have your name on that and you've got to get credit for it. And so partly the ideas of ancient authorship are different, but also, I think, because they knew they were passing on scripture. They were collecting things that had, that were coming from God. And so they weren't, they were putting themselves in the background and not putting themselves forward. Uh, they were servants of the word. Um, so it's interesting. Look in your Bibles. Look at, find the five books of Psalms and look at the end of them and find those doxologies and look at the last Psalms, uh, Psalm 145, this, this great Psalm of God's kingdom, and then 146 through 150, the conclusion of Hallelujah Psalms. It's a conclusion to the whole book of Psalms. Uh, it will be interesting to go and to look into those things. Yeah, Ardith. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That could be, yeah, that, that could be. It's a, it's a challenge and we can learn from things from that. Students out there, please put your names on your papers and please avoid plagiarism, okay? <laughs> Thank you for your attention tonight. <laughs>